Good to see you all, old friends, colleagues, uh, new friends. Um, what I want to talk about today, we're having a late start, is, um, so we're going to go over a little bit, people are going to hopefully stay around, is our study at NYU looking at um, the use of psilocybin and the mystical experience in the context of people with cancer or advanced cancer or at the end of life, uh, any attempts to alleviate and mitigate the existential distress that people go through, that will go through, possibly, at the end of our lives. Um, so um, instead of giving an overview of the study, which I typically do, I want to focus on the study a bit, define mystical experience, which you'll get to know about throughout the weekend, uh, discuss um, psycho-spiritual distress at the end of life. But I also want to show um, some of the results of two cases who I had the honor and the privilege to work with, two people, one since passed away, one is still with us, and they had what I consider full mystical experiences, and I want to talk about some of the uh, themes that emerged, and um, two of them was love and transcendence. When I made this title, I thought, am I really going to call this title love? But you know, they said the answer was love, and love is what healed them and transformed them. Um, so we're going to talk about their, um, their experiences. This first uh, screen, this relief is wonderful. This is a relief of uh, the Buddha on his deathbed. And um, this is the goal for how we should die, correct? Um, with peace, equanimity, and uh, without distress or um, anxiety. So let me just see what we have here. So we're gonna go to quarter after. I'm gonna briefly look at the psycho-spiritual factors in end-of-life care. I should mention I'm also a palliative care psychologist and I've worked with people with cancer at the end of life for years and the psilocybin experiences are just tremendous. And what can happen in, within a day, within a session, um, is more than what could have happened in years of working with someone who's approaching death, and it's just stunning to see the results. And uh, we're honored to be working with these brave uh, people. Um, we're going to discuss the meaning of life, uh, the meaning um, at the end of life. Uh, dis discuss briefly mystical and peak experiences, uh, some of the research. Uh, then these two topics of transcendence and meaning and love. Review our, our protocol, and again present two clinical vignettes. Is this working properly? Yeah, okay. Um, so how do we die in America? The answer is not too, not too well. Uh, the research is not very, um, not doing good, um, despite the fact that two Gallup polls uh, found that nine out of 10 people would rather die at home. Most don't die at home. Most die in institutions, ICUs, nursing homes, surrounded by plugs and medical staff, die in what we call bad deaths. I often ask people at a lecture, and I won't do it to you folks today, how would you want to die? And people say things like, Surrounded by loved ones, in my own bed, in a peaceful place, free of pain, surrounded by my children, um, things that are important to me. Uh, the, the sad fact in our country is most people die like this. Um, not in, in a place where we, you'd like to end your life. Uh, and, and the big, the, the part we're going to focus on is the existential part. Uh, of the suffering. It really is the most avoided conversation in medicine. You would think medical school and all the paths we go through to be healthcare providers, we would address uh, how we die, but we don't. Um, palliative care has just recently made some tremendous uh, improvement in how we die in America. We have a long way to go. And these psilocybin studies, these mystical experiences, profoundly can facilitate a healthy acceptance of death um, and uh, of, the, of the cycles of life. Why it's doing that? Okay. Um, so existential needs in cancer patients. I'll briefly review some of this the data. I don't want to bore you with too many too much literature, but there's really a paucity of things being addressed. In this one study, um, up to 51% of the patients who are at the end of life said they weren't having their needs met. Needs met on the psycho spiritual spectrum. Things like finding or creating meaning at the end of life, finding spiritual resources, having people to talk to about the meaning of life. And with the growing awareness on emotional suffering at the end of life, palliative care has increasingly focused on the specific domains of spiritual and existential distress as a key component of quality of life and cancer at end of life patients. This is an interesting study out of, John, out of um, Johns Hopkins, those are my friends, <laughs> but out of uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, where depression and hopelessness were really key contributors to a desire for a hastened death. Higher rates of clinical depression in cancer patients will link with a desire for a hastened death. Depressed patients were four times more likely to have a high desire for a hastened death than non-depressed patients. Among patients neither depressed nor hopeless, and that is possible even at the end of life. None had a high desire for a hastened death versus two thirds of those who were depressed and felt hopelessness. 
So the literature shows that depression, hopelessness are contributing to a, a bad death and the desire even for a hastened death. How do we address that? This is a syndrome that exists. It's not a um, DSM syndrome. It's a clinical syndrome separate from depression that affects those at the end of life. A psychiatric state in which hopelessness, meaningless, and distress are the core phenomena. And these are the, this is the hallmark of our study we're trying to change and correct and, and provide some healing for with these courageous patients who come in, or volunteers, I should say, um, hoping that the distress they're experiencing in the face of death can be mitigated, changed, even transformed to something quite beautiful, which is possible. People who, who successfully complete the process of searching for meaning, even at the end of life, can have a greater self-awareness and a personal growth and a connection to life, others, and nature. Viktor Frankl, who most of you I'm sure know, really spoke wonderfully about meaning at the end of life through his Holocaust experiences and a lot of his quotes and books have been kind of, uh, we gleaned from them um, uh, anecdotes to address our, our work. And this one, of course, is so stunning. Meaning can be found in life literally up to the last moment, up to the last breath, even in the face of death. So, I kind of hope you could read that. Uh, so, palliative care literature has emphasized the need for greater focus on spiritual interventions. And I think we have one in our psilocybin, a mystical facilitated approach model. Uh, spirituality and existential approaches form the basis for emerging novel therapeutic modalities to appear. There's really been a call throughout the field for new novel approaches to address this, this kind of suffering. We've gotten somewhat better in, in cancer, in, in oncology, um, at targeted chemotherapies and reducing pain and made a lot of progress. But there's still a positive approach to addressing the emotional distress that we're all gonna look at um, when we're facing the end. And they're asking for novel therapeutic approaches and I think you would agree a psychedelic facilitated mystical experience is a novel approach. I certainly do. Maybe too novel for some people. <laughs> Importantly, spiritual well-being and a sense of meaning appear to benefit persons at the end of life. And very importantly, and research has documented this now, documented literature and research, spiritual well-being and enhanced meaning have demonstrated to be buffers against hopelessness, depression, and a desire for a hastened death. So people who can cultivate a sense of meaning or transcendence, which we're gonna talk about today, um, at the end of life, actually, that serves as a buffer against those other, con those other constructs. Um, so how do we cultivate meaning? There are some specific meaning-targeted psychotherapies, um, and there's also a psilocybin approach. Man is not destroyed by suffering, he's destroyed by suffering without meaning. There's been a lot of um, literature reviews on the important factors at the end of life for patients. And over and over and over again, the key top, top two or three or top two um, issues are always uh, transcendence and meaning. And this really exhaustive meta-analysis of, of all the uh, literature um, published until this date, they questioned uh, patients and even physicians and families, what are the important um, factors? But patients most were, were the most important cohort. Uh, and again, the three most important factors that were important to them were meaning, self-transcendence, which we'll talk about, and transcendence with, with a higher being, with all that is, with God, however they want to define that. Even spirituality is defined something which allows a person to transcend meaning in life or a personal search for meaning, different from, from religion in a sense, more organized. Carl Jaspers, the existentialist, has a wonderful quote. Although a source of intense anxiety and fear, facing one's death can also lead to authenticity, living without postponement, courage without self-deception, profound serenity in the face of unceasing pain, peace in realizing the finality of death, acceptance, and yes, even dignity. I want to show you one study, and then I won't bore you with any more data, but this is really an interesting study that came out of um, Memorial Sloan Kettering. They um, surveyed a, a cohort of end-of-life patients with two, uh, two separate measures. One was a meaning and peace measure that measured um, the degree to the person has had transcendence, transcendent experiences, uh, experientially felt peace and meaning and, and cohesiveness on a very experiential, emotional level. The other one was, it was a faith measure, uh, their faith that something good would happen, their faith in God through dogma. And as you could probably guess, um, the, 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 the measure that measured meaning and peace, well, that subscale, was found to have the most influence on depression, 
hopeless and a desire for death. So it's not to knock faith at all, but the experience of these patients, of having those experiences, of transcendence meaning, seem to be a better buffer and a better healer at the end of life than just faith. And Joseph Campbell said it perfectly, I don't need faith, I have experience. So you all know these characteristics, you'll hear them a lot throughout the week and then on all the, uh, most of the talks, especially around end of life talks and the, the psilocybin studies. But what is a mystical state of consciousness? Briefly, and I credit Walter Pankey and Bill Richards who's here somewhere, our colleague and mentor for this uh, wonderful um, list. A uh, sense of unity, a sense of oneness achieved through transcendence. Again, the word transcendence. Um, often described as the ground of being, Paul Tillich, the void, Brahman, all that is. Transcendence of time and space. And in our case, we'll talk about transcending the body, the cancer, the disease. Being freed up, being liberated from the, from the bounded pain of a, of a body with cancer. People often come out and say, I'm not my cancer. I'm not this body. I'm something different. A deeply felt positive mood, a sense of sacredness. Rudolf Otto's Mysterium Tremendum and then Jung's Numinosity. Awe and wonder. The Noetic Quality, described by William James. You could read that if you could see those words. These, these uh, experiences are very hard to describe. People come back and have a hard time articulating them, but they do. They do very well, as uh, best they can. And we ask each uh, volunteer to write down a journal of their experience. And I'll read you today, quoting uh, some patients who came through the study. And uh, it's quite profound what they, what, they, what they have said, even though words fall, for, fall far short and a persisting change in attitude and behavior. I won't go through all the history, but you have to always name three books, at least I do. Um, they're not, <laughs> there's a lot of contemporary stuff happening, but we're not here without some of these foundational texts. Of course, William James is. This book is tremendous. Who knows Richard Buck's Cosmic Consciousness? How many people here? Okay, more hands should be raised. I recommend you all go out and get the book. It's still in your bookstores. I think the most important book, one of the most important books of the last century, came out the time, someone's nodding, he agrees with me, um, came out the time of William James's book and um, written by a Canadian psychiatrist who described his own spontaneous mystical experience as just beautifully written. Um, and then he chronicles throughout history figures like Buddha, Jesus, Walt Whitman, Blake, Dante, Balzac, Bacon, Spinoza, and then regular folk who he knew uh, in contemporary society who had a mystical experience experience spontaneously and he profiles their experiences and it's quite profound it's beautiful and he talks about the transcendence and finally Rudolf Otto's book is very very um, important in discussing the numinosity which greatly aff affected Carl Jung and then of course Huxley um, who was kind of a, a godfather to this research in some ways although not a scientist he introduced these um, these, these ideas through his work with Vendanta and then through psychedelic research uh, and of course he said, um, he said many things, but the dying face, increasing pain, anxiety, increased morphine, ultimate disintegration, uh, but they don't die with dignity. Uh, earlier, Bob Jesse recommended the book Island. I do as well. It's, it profoundly blew my socks off many years ago, and it's a great book. I love this picture. So allegedly, this is a picture of Alice Huxley actually on Mescaline on his first trip. I find it charming because only a, an, English, an Englishman literary fellow would trip with a tweed jacket on. <laughs> And I, you know, where are those good old days? <laughs> you know, you get dressed up for a good trip, you know, so that, that's a gentleman and a scholar, you know, no, no t-shirt, no jeans, I'm, honey, I'm going someplace today and I'm getting dressed up, <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, incredible human being he was. So real quick, you're going to know all about this throughout the weekend, but some contemporary, contemporary, going back 50 years already, there's the Walty Panky study, which really showed that psilocybin can um, create a mystical experience, as was found throughout millennia and all the great religious traditions. Uh, Rick Doblin, many years later, found the surviving members, and they still um, insisted that the, 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 the outcomes and the experiences lasted. Um, and more recently, the Hopkins um, crew uh, wonderfully have created a new foundation for us to all stand on with the 2006 six um, research that psilocybin can indeed induce or occasion a mystical experience like those found throughout millennia. Uh, and even in a follow-up study, 
they were still having incredible results. I won't go through all this. Roland will, I'm sure, tomorrow. But up to 60, 70 percent of patients and volunteers rated the psilocybin-induced mystical experience as being the most, either the five most or among the five most spiritual important of their life. And I'll let him talk tomorrow about that. But it was an incredible um, burst of activity that now I think has really ushered in this whole new level of research. So there's been a call for more research um, and from some strange uh, corners. Um, Dr. Herbert Lieber, uh, who was the deputy czar uh, for the White House under George Bush Sr. Um, in reviewing uh, the Hopkins uh, paper, uh, said, uh, discovering how these mystical and altered states um, can arise in the brain could have major possibilities, treatment of pain, treatment of refractory depression, um, but also for the suffering of the terminally ill. Uh, it would be short-sighted not to pursue them. And we're, we're pursuing them. Since then, there's been a lot of research in the 60s on cancer, there was some, um, and more recently, Charlie Grobe um, got that ball rolling again with his published study of a, a pilot study of psilocybin in cancer patients at UCLA, which showed a reduction in anxiety, and it was shown to be very safe. And now the two existing studies are Hopkins um, and then NYU. Let's talk about transcendence for a little bit, and then I want to talk about these two patients. So, um, a review of the, sorry? Yes, I'm trying to race, but I will. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. If you promise to stay, I'll slow down. Okay. So I'm going to throw the watch into the river. Reviews of palliative, thank you. Reviews of palliative care literature um, show that transcendence and meaning are the most common factors. In a study focused on end-of-life, self-transcendence was found to be significantly related to well-being and quality of life in people with AIDS and HIV positive and with advanced breast cancer. Self-transcendence includes behaviors and attitudes that are both psychologically and spiritually uh, important and give a sense of meaning and acceptance um, and living fully in the present. Transcendence, the ability to extend the self beyond the immediate context to achieve new perspectives, is seen as important in the last phases of life where dying patients are encouraged to maintain a sense of well-being in the face of biological and social loss. Even in the midst of suffering, it is possible to create something that is beautiful. It is possible, and our teachers who are these patients have shown us that. I won't read too many of these. Uh, let's see. Well, I think you know what self-transcendence is. Really transcends to a more transpersonal core, to a, to a sense beyond the, this ego, this body, this level. This is a wonderful article by a, um, a fellow named Ignu. Um, what he did was interview some of the greatest thinkers on the topic of suffering. Eric Cassell, who wrote the landmark study article, 1982, on suffering and medicine, who I'm going to quote from in a moment. Um, Kubler-Ross, Cicely Saunders, the founder of the hospice movement, Bernie Siegel, Steve, I mean, just an incredible group of thinkers. And he got them in a room and he, and he spoke with them and tried to do a qualitative analysis on how they define healing. And it's wonderful. Healing is to make, this is the actual definition that we all live by, to make sound or whole to restore a person to spiritual wholeness. And healing, to heal, is from the root hal, which is the root of, which is the, root of the word holy, spiritually pure. Wholeness involves physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual dimensions. Healing is independent of illness. That's what Bernie Siegel said. It's independent of the cancer, impairment, cure of disease, or even death. So we have to really view healing not just on the body, but on multiple levels, including the spiritual level. Sick body can still be, that person, that self, can be healed. Healing is independent of the cancer. And they concluded with their definition of healing. Healing is the personal experience of the transcendence of suffering. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said, it's about a year before she died, if you become whole again, you're healed. Eric Cassell wrote a wonderful paper in 1982. It's a, it's, a, it's a landmark paper. It's a classic in medicine. He wasn't speaking about psychedelics. He was speaking about suffering, um, the nature of suffering in medicine. But when you read this, man, oh man, could he be speaking about our psychedelic research? 
um, I only came across this in the past five years again after knowing it years ago, and it just struck me, man, he's really, he's, he's really speaking about what we're talking about. Transcendence is probably the most powerful way in which one is restored to wholeness after an injury to personhood, in our case, cancer. When experienced, transcendence locates the person in a far larger landscape. The suffering is not isolated by pain, but is brought closer to a transpersonal source of meaning and to the human community that shares those meanings. Such an experience need not involve religion in any formal sense. However, in its transpersonal dimension, it is deeply spiritual. And he continues very poignantly. Everyone has a transcendent dimension, a life of the spirit. This is most directly expressed in religion and the mystic traditions. But the frequency with which people have intense feelings of bonding with groups, ideals, or anything larger and more enduring than the person is evidence of the universality of the transcendent dimension. The quality of being greater and more lasting than an individual life gives this aspect of the person its timeless dimension. The profession of medicine appears to ignore the human spirit. When I see patients in nursing homes who have become only bodies, I wonder, whether, whether it is not their transcendent dimension that has been lost. My colleague and friend Bill Richards, in terms of, the, in the context of psychedelic experiences, and he mentions the word love again, he, of, this is his, Bill writing about these experiences with cancer patients, eternity, a state of awareness outside of time, often described as pulsating with love, and life no longer is an abstract concept, but rather is a memory of an experience. It is interesting that in the wake of this experience, personal immortality, the ego continuing, is rather unimportant. Rather, the conviction is expressed that whatever it, it is that matters, indeed, indeed endures. And what is that that endures? And that's, I think, our question and our, our goal in life. What endures beyond the, the physical form? Albert Einstein always says it wonderfully, the mystical, so beautiful, but also I love this second piece. Um, the true value of human being is determined by the measure and the sense in which they have obtained liberation from the self. We shall require a new manner of thinking if humanity is to even survive. Our study at NYU looks at people from ages 18 to 76 with the diagnosis of cancer. Um, they could be in remission at this point, but they must have a, a coexistent significant form of anxiety um, because of the cancer diagnosis. And many people have advanced cancer, and many people are at the end of life. Each patient has two sessions, a placebo and a psilocybin session. I won't go too into it deeply. Steve Ross and Jeff Gus, my colleagues, are gonna speak over the weekend more in the study itself, but I wanna get to these patient vignettes. Um, as pre-session interviews and, 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 and helping them and guiding them and, and preparing them, there's a dose and it's a post-integrative period. Um, it's really important to have a, a proper set and setting. You all know what that is, of course. I'm, I'm gonna skip through the inclusion criteria. These are some of the things we're measuring, things from mood and death acceptance, spirituality, transcendence, mystical states. These courageous uh, volunteers fill out a lot of paperwork um, to hopefully catch, capture the data that we hope will, will change things in, in medicine. The first phase, we sit with them for a few weeks, get to know them, rapport is so important. Without trust and rapport, we really can't advance to a psilocybin session. Um, we help educate them as to some possibilities. We, we give them some loose advice how to approach various things within the experience. But the most important being that it applies to today's cases is um, no matter what is happening, go into it, surrender to it, go into it with all meaning and intention, and don't turn away from whatever comes up. So this is not a good set and setting. Ms. Updike, please hold my calls for the rest of the afternoon. I've just taken some LSD. <laughs> so we, this is a better set and setting. This is our room at NYU. It's kind of an elegant living room. This is the a photograph actually on the day of a session. Um, so you see the, the couch is made into kind of a bed, and it looks better in, in real life, but this picture is kind of distorted. Um, and there's fresh flowers and a lovely rug, a very expensive rug. <laughs> um, <laughs> That slush fund came through with the $10,000 rug. Um, uh, and um, a special soundtrack and music and headphones, and it's, it's a lovely setting for the experience they're gonna have. 
uh, in the session itself, they're encouraged to lie down, um, go into the emotional state, go into the journey as, as it occurs. If they have to, of course, they can sit up, but most people do adhere to the guidelines of lying down. They're safe, they're trusted. We tell them they're safe. We're watching them. The music plays throughout the headphones, throughout the, throughout the six-hour experience. Um, they're encouraged to focus on all internal experiences, um, joyous or frightening. And most frightening experiences will change, as we'll see later in this patient's vignette. I'm just going to run through these later. Um, let me quickly. And then after the session, we have a few weeks, of course, of integrating, talking about, exploring what actually happened. So and that's our lovely team. We're growing by that's administrators and clinicians. We're getting bigger by the minute. It's Albert Einstein again. His lips to God's ears. I have five minutes. Okay, we gotta get to the case. So you're gonna give me nine minutes. I'm gonna negotiate with you. Okay. You can't you, you can't walk out on a patient's vignette. I want to discuss two patients who this first patient uh, um, an incredible young man, mid fifties, had metastatic cancer. He's since passed away. Uh, just incredible, credible person. Um, was diagnosed in 07. I'll get go through this. He had a horrible chemotherapy protocol where he was given every other week a very aggressive form of chemotherapy that just rendered him unable to even function. In the alternate weeks, he was up and work and going out and, and living a life. Smart, progressive, lovely guy. Um, and on one of his sessions, which I'm, I'm going to guess was the psilocybin session, um, he was lying there. Um, and, um, and I should say his intention was to, of course, ease the anxiety um, of his cancer and of his diagnosis. When he came in, he wasn't end of life yet, but he quickly progressed and he died shortly after the study was over. Um, he was laying on the couch. We, he had taken the pill. We don't know what it was, of course. And about two hours into the experience, he was laying there just still, just looking beautiful. And he utters the words, birth and death is a lot of work. And I think we knew we were on our way. Um, his only message of, was that love, warmth, and acceptance uh, and connection to something much greater. Early on, he had a very turbulent and difficult rebirthing experience, physically and emotionally, which was quite profound, and I won't go into detail about it right now. But it was a profound experience. When it was over, he went from this very, as a woman giving birth, a very a traumatic and difficult uh, birthing session, a rebirthing. Um, when it was over, he just was catapulted into an incredible space, um, as he described it, a brown cocoon gel, where for hours he was just facing nothing but complete overwhelming love and peace. And I want to quote one of his, um, one of his quotes from his long, beautiful journal. Um, oh, before that, he met criteria for a full mystical experience. He called it life-changing, experience of love like nothing I've experienced before. He lives more in the present, less anxious regarding his cancer. Quality of life dramatically improved. Um, no longer fear of dying, and the cancer was almost irrelevant. Um, the main thing was love, love, love. It was filled with love. There was no beginning nor, nor no end. No death, no beginning, like the Zen masters have taught us. He experienced infinity, and that it was love. And I'm going to read from his journal. This is after that rebirthing experience and this incredible two, three hour experience. He's laying there, just tears coming down his face in the face of incredible transcendent um, joy and love. From here on, love is the only consideration. Everything that happened, anything and everything that was seen or heard centered on love. It was and is the only purpose. Love seemed to emanate from a single point of light. It was so pure, the sheer joy. The bliss was indescribable. And in fact, there are no words to accurately describe my experience, my state, this place. I know of no earthly pleasure that's ever come close to this feeling. No sensation, no image of beauty, nothing during my time on earth has felt as pure and joyful and glorious as the height of this journey. I felt very warm and pleasantly so. I was beginning to wonder if man spent too much time and effort at things unimportant, trying to accomplish so much when really it was all so simple. The matter of the subject, it all came down to one thing, love. Earthly matters such as food, music, architecture, anything and everything, Aside from love, seems silly and trivial. All our countless and never-ending attempts to get to the source are overproduced. We put too many notes in a song, too many ingredients in our recipes, too many flourishes in our clothes we wear, the houses we live. It all seems so pointless. We needed to focus on love. I was convinced in that moment that I had figured it out or it was figured out for me, and it was right there in front of me, love, the only thing that mattered. 
A brief death. I was aware in a sense that my earth life had stopped. I was now presented with an opportunity to go close to the source of light and vibration. Everything peeling away, object by object, molecule by molecule. I approached what appeared to be a very sharp pointed piece of stainless steel, razor blade quality to it. I looked into the apex of the shiny metal object as I arrived. I had a choice to look in or not look over the edge into the infinite abyss, the vastness of the universe, the eye of everything, of nothing. I thought about my cancer. I took a tour of my lungs. I could see some things. He had tumors in his lungs. But it was a more matter of feeling inside of my lungs. I recall breathing deeply to help facilitate the scene. They were modules, but they seemed rather unimportant. I was being told, without words, not to worry about the cancer. It's minor in the scheme of things, simply an imperfection of your humanity, and that the more important matter, the work to be done before you, love. Undoubtedly, my life has changed in ways I may never fully comprehend, but now I have an understanding, an awareness that goes beyond intellect, that my life, that every life, and that all that is universe equals one thing, love. He died an incredible death. I was with him a few days before he died, and it was just one of the most incredible deaths I've ever witnessed in my life. It was more than a good death. It was just an incredible death. He was not afraid, and to the day he died, he attributed this study as being the second most important thing in his life outside of his marriage to his lovely wife, and he really went in a very peaceful and loving way. And um, I, I can't talk about it, but it was the most profound thing I've witnessed, and, I, and this really helped him. One quick other woman. Um, by the way, Cicely Saunders, who is the founder of the Modern Hospice Movement, says, even to the end of life, the inner self can stretch and broaden and make new discoveries. We neither have to idealize nor see the dark side only, but perhaps we need to look difficulties in the face and name them. Remember that for the next vignette real quick. They may lose their power to hurt or hinder. You can find a degree of wholeness as a person, whether you get better or not, whether you're suffering or not. And I certainly have seen people find wholeness even as they die. Real quickly, some woman in the mid-50s, metastatic breast cancer, um, her cancer is doing well. Treatment's been working, but she came into the study with crippling fever of recurrence, and she couldn't function. Her, and she's an atheist, um, and still is, but had a full mystical experience. Go figure that out. Um, and she, um, her experience was profound. She began also a very, very turbulent beginning, and she, and she pictured, she experienced the cancer in front of her, a big dark mass looking right at her. And she was coached before the session for weeks to not avoid, not to avoid. And she looked at it and spoke to it and said, what the hell do you want? Who are you? Why are you doing this to me? And jumped into it. At that moment, it clicked like the rebirthing with the earlier patient. And she went into a two, three hour experience of infinite love. Here are some quotes of hers. The intensity of all the love and being, such a wonderful experience, changes everywhere. It's why we're here. It's all change. I'm not anxious anymore about my cancer. I am everything. Everything is me. Um, it was timeless. I'm not afraid. There's no room for being afraid. I can't even imagine it. Um, I have no fear of recurrence of cancer. It does not enter my mind. Everything is better. Every encounter is better. Such depth of emotion. Everything is love. Since then, she's been doing wonderfully in her life. She's functional. She's going around. She's working. And she's a lovely um, example of when we're liberated from, the, from this level of what can happen. Um, and let me just close with one thing. Um, so nothing is faster than suffering. The more we suffer, the, er the earlier the spiritual quadrant opens and matters. Um, people can heal despite that we're dying. Um, if you become whole, you're healed. I want to close with a tribute to the first patient, who, um, the gentleman I talked about, who was um, just something else. Uh, after the study was over, he went to see the movie A Tree of Life. Who's seen the movie Tree of Life? Uh, we, we, we spoke a lot about it, but I hadn't seen it yet, but I read a lot about it. And, and he went to see it one evening. and. Um, he called me that evening, he started with his wife. He was still not end of life yet, but soon to very go do poorly medically. And um, he said they sat in their chairs for 30 minutes crying, they couldn't leave the theater. He said it reminded him just like the psilocybin experience, and it really, it was very transformative. Um, I saw the movie only later, and, um, and we spoke about it a bit, but then when I saw it, I realized why it was so important to him. The themes of love and, of course, birth, death, and maybe the illusion of birth and death are throughout the movie. I want to quote a little bit in closing from The Tree of Life, Terrence Malick's film. The only way to be happy is to love. Unless you love, your life will flash by. Love everyone, every leaf, every ray of light. Forgive. With all due respect to Terrence Malick, I think he'd lean these words from someone else because I found this quote by Dostoevsky, which is, I think, the broader version. <laughs> but... And I'd like to read the full quote. Um, Love every leaf, every ray of God's light. 
Love the animals, love the plants, love everything. If you love everything, you will perceive the divine mystery in things. Once you perceive it, you will begin to comprehend it better every day. And you will come at last to love the whole world with an all-embracing love. Thanks for your attention. Uh, it's 12.15, so lunch is there, but if, I'll take questions as well. Yes. Uh, I actually have a question that's been really standing out of my mind throughout this whole thing. You want a mic? Okay, go ahead. And, uh, Do we have a microphone? Have Cypress? Have yeah, I have a... Oh, is this even working? Well, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I have a question that's basically been standing out of my mind, this whole convention, in which I think is going to be really important to all areas of psychedelic research. And that, is, and that is relating to something I've heard a lot of opponents of psychedelics say, uh, of people who believe that psychedelics should remain illegal, that they're dangerous, stuff like that. And this is the belief that things like meditation, that things like things like meditation and, and psychological counseling and things like that could achieve very many of the same things that you were talking about, so, like very many of the same perceptions of death, like all the things about love, all the things about these other things. And so it brings me to the question, why psychedelics? Why psilocybin? Like, what's so special about these things that 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 things like medication, that things like th that things like meditation and psychological counseling cannot do? So that is okay. kind of my question. The question is, why psychedelics? Why are they so special? Why not just meditation? Um, I don't know if they're very special. I think the experience is very special. I'm not sure these are drug studies per se. I think the, the important part is the experience. Um, and most people who have had an awakening with the uh, entheogen go on to develop long-time life meditative practices and the entheogens fall away. So I would agree in part, but these entheogens seem to have a reliable way of activating a mystical experience um, throughout history. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yep. The mic isn't working, but go ahead. I can't see anybody. A uh, quick question about dosages for those uh, incredible experiences that you shared. For those two, point two milligrams per kilogram so is pr it's weighted per patient's weight. Point two um, milligrams per kilogram. Point three milligrams. So it's pretty three. moderate. Point three milligrams per kilogram is the dose. Um, so it's it's titrated to the weight of the patient. Okay. Uh, it's a little more than the UCLA study, and it's um, been shown to provide a good uh, good result. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead. I can't. I can't hear or see, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm I have. Old. I have two questions. Yeah. One is, um, well, not uh, everyone who took this uh, drug. Yes. Uh, feel this uh, mystical experience, no? Does everyone know? No, no, not every, not every patient. The Hopkins study were, were helpful in that first study. Not everyone had a mystical experience, and I think the greater the mystical experience, the greater the clinical measures are met. Um, so these two patients who I work with did have what I think, our data isn't complete yet, mystical experience, but everyone does not have the complete same type experience. There uh, are, go ahead. My uh, question is, uh, what, um, because I, I suppose that there are some other things, some other aspect related to psychotherapy who uh, could uh, allow this kind of experience. Uh, so I uh, would like to know what other things you think you uh, think that they are important for this kind of experience in a psychotherapeutic uh, process. Other things that are important for these type of patients? Yes, other things related to psychotherapy or to the therapist. That's uh, one question. And the second question is, um, well, you are working with the here, uh, with the death experience. So uh, I wonder, uh, which is the different uh, for you as a therapist, work with this, uh, uh, with this um, process? Uh, with this, uh, with, with psilocybin. Okay, so the first question is what other modalities, uh, what kind of psychotherapies can be helpful in this way? Am I correct? Sorry? The first question is what other modalities can be helpful? What kind of psychotherapies? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, there, there are meaning centered psychotherapies that have been tar founded out of, out of um, 
Sloan Kettering, where the it's a, it's a longitudinal course where the, the goal is to help patients cultivate meaning. Um, other, you know, music therapy, other modalities have tried to even foster self-transcendence. I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in meditation and various forms of meditative practice as a spiritual path. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence most people have had an awakening of the heart with the um, entheogen go on to develop strong, lifelong meditative practices that maintains a connection to that experience in some ways. Regarding the second question, I wasn't quite getting it all. Uh, sorry, my English, but... It's okay. No, uh, your English is fine, but I just can't. No, the second question, um, you're working with that experience here. Right. Uh, this could be very anxiety for the therapist. This could this, uh, work with this subject could be very um, uh, di uh, very difficult for the therapist. To the therapist, right? Yes, to you. So yes. I would like to know if work with psilocybin, uh, it could be different to you work uh, with the, that experience. Is the work different? So um, work with palliative care is difficult. It's also profoundly rewarding. I think you go home every night realizing what's important and you hug your child a little stronger. Um, and um, I think a lot of help can be gotten through you know, psychotherapy. How is psilocybin different? It's profoundly different, obviously. Um, is it difficult? I think so. Yeah, I mean, nothing's, nothing's not difficult. I, you know, you're, you're going on a journey of, with the patient. You, you're not going, they're going on a journey, but you're with them. Um, as they encounter and, and confront some very um, powerful and, and potentially difficult uh, material. Um, so I think you need to be very present and to be profoundly compassionate and have good clinical training, because many things can come up from their biographical history and psychodynamic literature may come up as well, uh, materials. Um, so is it difficult? Yes, it affects us. I'm in complete awe of these patients and of this research. I sit there and just can't believe I'm sitting there watching this patient have the experience and I get out of the way and let it happen because when they're having the experience, there's not much I'm going to do or, or can do. So I just sit back and allow the medicine and, and the experience to work. But it's profoundly uh, rewarding. Okay, well you then you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the question is why, why psilocybin, not mescaline or LSD? You know, um, I mean, short answer, other studies that are going on, Hopkins and UCLA use psilocybin, so there's a, there's a contemporary track record. There's also a track record going back to the 50s and the 60s, the safety, it's reliable, it's shorter lasting. I think LSD has a very kind of strong cultural baggage. It's longer lasting as well, six to 10 hours. I think MDMA has been effective, but has another whole set of um, concerns. Psilocybin seems to be uh, the right time frame, has a track record throughout history as well in terms of spiritual traditions, and I think it evokes a very kind of spiritual um, texture and, and terrain and, and and, and a flavor that I think um, is germane to these experiences. They tell me to wrap up, but yes, and I, and I, could, I could chat afterwards. Go ahead. What mindset, what, what mindset variables uh, uh, have you found best facilitate uh, the desired outcome? That's a good question. So, so set and setting are crucial, right, going back to the early Leary, uh, Ramdas, uh, Metzner days, it's all about set and setting. So set, the mindset, um, well, first is rule outs that I couldn't get into today, but there are a lot of rule outs, psychiatric rule outs that, we, that would rule a person out. So that's part of the set. Um, every You're talking about the rule in. So the rule ends. Um, well, trust and rapport with the guides, with the monitors, um, an understanding of what, what could happen, and a, a proper intention when they're trying to cure cancer. So a proper intention to be, to be healed on the level they came in for. Um, you know, and, um, it's such a complex question and, and, a, and a large one. We spent a lot of time working with them before the dosing. Um, I would say if I had to you know, list them, trust and rapport is crucial. Of course, we're assuming psychologically they're stable to have this, so that goes without saying. Um, but I think proper intention and, and, and rapport with the, with the guides. I could I chat afterwards, and I'm, I'm burning up in the light anyway. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you all, old friends, colleagues, uh, new friends. Um, what I want to talk about today, having a late start, is um, so we're going to go over a little bit. People are going to hopefully stay around. Is our study at NYU you're looking at um, the use of psilocybin and the mystical experience in the context of people with cancer or advanced cancer or at the end of life, uh, and the attempts to alleviate 
and mitigate the existential distress that people go through, that will go through, possibly, at the end of our lives. Um, so um, instead of giving an overview of the study, which I typically do, I want to focus on the study a bit, define mystical experience, which you'll get to know about throughout the weekend, uh, discuss um, psycho-spiritual distress at the end of life, but I also want to show um, some of the results of two cases who I had the honor and the privilege to work with, two people, one since passed away, one is still with us, and they had what I consider full mystical experiences, and I want to talk about some of the uh, themes that emerged, and um, two of them was love and transcendence. When I made this title, I thought, am I really going to call this title love? But you know, they said the answer was love, and love is what healed them and transformed them. Um, so we're going to talk about their, um, their experiences. This first uh, screen, this relief is wonderful. This is a relief of uh, the Buddha on his deathbed. And um, this is the goal for how we should die, correct? Um, with peace, equanimity, helplessness, we're really key contributors to a desire for a hastened death. Higher rates of clinical depression and cancer patients will link with a desire for a hastened death. Depressed patients are four times more likely to have a high desire for a hastened death than non-depressed patients. Among patients, neither depressed nor hopeless, and that is possible even at the end of life. None had a high desire for a hastened death versus two-thirds of those who were depressed and felt hopelessness. So the literature shows that depression and hopelessness are contributing to a, a bad death and a desire even for a hastened death. How do we address that? This is a syndrome that exists. It's not a um, DSM syndrome. It's a clinical syndrome separate from depression that affects those at the end of life. A psychiatric state in which hopelessness, meaningless, and distress are the core phenomena. And these are the, this is the hallmark of our study. We're trying to change and correct and, and provide some healing for with these courageous patients who come in, or volunteers, I should say, um, hoping that the distress they're experiencing in the face of death can be mitigated, changed, even transformed to something quite beautiful, which is possible. People who, who successfully complete the process of searching for meaning, even at the end of life, can have a greater self-awareness and a personal growth and a connection to life other than without distress or um, anxiety. So let me just see what we have here. So we're going to go to quarter after. I'm going to briefly look at the psycho-spiritual factors in end-of-life care. I should mention I'm also a palliative care psychologist, and I've worked with people with cancer at the end of life for years, and the psilocybin experiences are just tremendous. And what can happen in, within a day, within a session, um, is more than what could have happened in years of working with someone who's approaching death, and it's just stunning to see the results, and uh, we're honored to be working with these brave uh, people. Um, we're going to discuss the meaning of life, uh, the meaning um, at the end of life, uh, dis discuss briefly mystical and peak experiences, uh, some of the research. Uh, then these two topics of transcendence and meaning and love, review our, our protocol, and again, present two clinical vignettes. Is this working properly? Yeah, okay. Um, so how do we die in America? The answer is not too, not too well. Uh, the research is not very, um, not doing good. Um, despite the fact that two Gallup polls uh, found that nine out of 10 people would rather die at home, most don't die at home, most die in institutions, ICUs, nursing homes, surrounded by plugs and medical staff, die in what we call bad deaths. I often ask people at a lecture, and I won't do it to you folks today, how would you want to die? And people say things like, surrounded by loved ones, in my own bed, in a peaceful place, free of pain, surrounded by my children, um, things that are important to me. Uh, the, the sad fact in our country is most people die like this. Um, not in a, in a place where we, you'd like to end your life. Uh, and, and the big, the, the part we're gonna focus on is the existential part uh, of the suffering. It really is the most avoided conversation in medicine. You would think medical school and all the paths we go through to be healthcare providers, we would address uh, how we die, but we don't. Um, palliative care has just recently made some tremendous uh, improvement in how we die in America. We have a long way to go. And these psilocybin studies, these mystical experiences, profoundly can facilitate a healthy acceptance of death um, and uh, of, the, of the cycles of life. 
sure why it's doing that. Okay. Um, so existential needs in cancer patients. I'll briefly review some of this data. I don't want to bore you with too many too much literature, but there's really a paucity of things being addressed. In this one study, um, up to 51% of the patients who are at the end of life said they weren't having their needs met needs met on the psychospiritual spectrum. Things like finding or creating meaning at the end of life, finding spiritual resources, having people to talk to about the meaning of life. And with the growing awareness on emotional suffering at the end of life, palliative care has increasingly focused on the specific domains of spiritual and existential distress as a key component of quality of life and cancer at end of life patients. It's an interesting study out of, John, out of um, Johns Hopkins, those are my friends, <laughs> but out of uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, where depression and hope is in nature. Viktor Frankl, who most of you I'm sure know, really spoke wonderfully about meaning at the end of life through his Holocaust experiences, and a lot of his quotes and books have been kind of, uh, we gleaned from them, um, uh, anecdotes to address our, our work. And this one, of course, is so stunning. Meaning can be found in life literally up to the last moment, up to the last breath, even in the face of death. So, I kind of hope you could read that. Uh, so, palliative care literature has emphasized the need for greater focus on spiritual interventions. And I think we have one in our psilocybin, a mystical <laughs> facilitated approach model. Uh, spirituality and existential approaches form the basis for emerging novel therapeutic modalities to appear. There's really been a call throughout the field for new novel approaches to address this, this kind of suffering. We've gotten somewhat better in, in cancer, in, in oncology, um, at targeted chemotherapies and reducing pain and made a lot of progress. But there's still a paucity of approaches addressing the emotional distress that we're all going to look at um, when we're facing the end. And they're asking for novel therapeutic approaches, and I think you would agree a psychedelic facilitated mystical experience is a novel approach. <laughs> I certainly do. Maybe too novel for some people. <laughs> Importantly, spiritual well-being and a sense of meaning appear to benefit persons at the end of life and, ver 